Uh, this morning, we're, like I said, we're going to continue in our series on God relationships and human flourishing. Some mouthful, isn't it? Uh, this morning, we're particularly going to focus in on singleness. What does it mean to be single and to live well or to live strong single? Uh, it's not something we often talk about within church life. Church life doesn't often highlight or focus in on something like this. Uh, we've been looking at lots of different things over the last few weeks. Uh, we've been thinking about uh, our relationships. We've been thinking about marriage. We've been thinking about what God's plan for marriage is. Uh, and I wonder how it's been tracking for you. I wonder how you found these last few weeks as we've been looking at some of this stuff. Uh, perhaps you found it really straightforward and thought, yeah, this is great. Perhaps for others, it's been a little bit like using the toilets at the swimming pool. <laughs> you ever those moments? You go to the toilet at the swimming pool, you're in bare feet, and you're thinking the floor's wet. I think it's okay. I think I can trust it. I definitely need to do it, so we're going to have to go for it. It is important we talk about these things, isn't it? Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's difficult, but we do need to look at these things. And that's perhaps been your experience as we've walked this tightrope these last few weeks, thinking about these different things. This morning we hit the topic of singleness and being single. And again, it feels like we're on that tightrope. How do we talk about this well? How do we talk about it in the right way? How do we honour those who are single? How do we honour those who are married? And what does the Bible particularly say about it? That's what we want to think about this morning. Because singleness is something that does affect all of us. Because at some point in our lives, every single one of us was single. Statistically, most of us will end our lives single. That's a sad but true statistic. We will all know single people. We will all know people who are living their lives in, uh, on their own, without a partner or a spouse. And it's important that we think about how we engage with that as Christians, how we support, how we live well, and how we honour. And depending on our age and our stage, being single will feel very, very different. There's something very different about being a teenager who is single, towards being someone who perhaps is in their 50s or in their 60s or even older who might be single. And so we want to talk about it well. We want to honour those who are single. And one of the things that I've struggled with a little bit coming into this is knowing that I am not. And that being the family's pastor, I tend to be the one who's standing at the front of church really promoting family life and highlighting all the different family events that are going on and all the wonderful things that we can do together as families. And so I've struggled a little bit with it. But one of the things that's reassured me and one of the things that's been really helpful I've found is that it isn't about me. It's not about what I think. It's not about what uh, I can bring to it. It's about what God's word has to say about it and what God has to say. And so this morning, that is my prayer that we would see what God has to say about these things through his word and if you reflect on it together. Let's think a little bit to start off with about singleness in society. We live in a society which really does promote the 2.4 lifestyle. I don't know if you spotted that, but there is this assumption in life that meeting a partner, getting married, and having children is the happy ever after lifestyle. That's what kind of society puts out there. It's the basis for the perfect rom-com. All movies, really, not just the, the rom-coms, have some kind of love interest going on in there, don't they? You know, think of Harry Potter, you've got Ron and Hermione in there. Even Lord of the Rings, you end up with Samwise. He's the one who gets the girl at the end of the movie. There's always uh, some kind of relationship in there. They kind of become some kind of big hurdle, perhaps, throughout the movie. And then at the end of it, the couple get together, and isn't it lovely? And everyone thinks they're going to live happily ever after, at least until the credits roll. And after that, nobody really knows what happens, do they? Uh, but it does seem that the key to happiness, as far as society is concerned, is find a partner and settle down. And in an instant culture that we live in, now you don't have to put the hard work in. You don't have to try particularly hard. You go onto a website, you fill in the survey, and they do all the hard work for you. They'll find you your perfect match, the perfect person for you. We love the entertainment of it as well, don't we? watch TV shows that are just completely devoted to relationships. 
I tried to come up with a few. I got a little bit of help from those within my family. Uh, take me out, married at first sight, first dates, dating on the spectrum, love is blind, blind date, love island, love island, the all-stars. They're the ones that we could just think of in a few minutes. But there are countless others, I am sure. A relationship, as far as society is concerned, is the place for happiness. And the message has gone down from one generation to the next, from Cat Stevens down to Boyzone. Find a girl, settle down, and if you want, you can marry. Look at me. Do you know the song I'm talking about? I'm not going to sing it. Re See, I told you to be a grown at some point. Someone was going to... I'm not going to sing it, no. Uh, but that is the assumption, isn't it? And very often, we'll put that message onto our children as well, without even realising. Sometimes we'll even talk about, if we have children that are kind of heading into the age of settling down, we might talk of two of them are married, one of them's not yet married. Like, that's the goal, that's the thing that we are working towards. Singleness can become this stage or this phase that we want to try and get through before life begins. So if that's the message that's given in culture, that's, if that's what we're seeing in society, what's the good news that Christians have to offer to that? What's the good news that God's word brings into those situations? How do we deal with that? Because the truth is that the reality is very different. Not everybody does get married. Not everyone does have a spouse or have perfect family life. Let's just watch a little bit of Kelly's story here. One of my greatest hopes and goals in life was that I would grow up, go to college, get an education, meet someone, have a family. That's how I pictured my life. And so each year or each season that would move forward that didn't look like that and that didn't match up was devastating. After college, I did meet someone. We grew really close and I thought that it was leading towards something and it looked like dating. It just wasn't called that. After the relationship ended, I felt very hurt by that person and just very embarrassed that that happened to me, that I thought I had something that wasn't real. I felt a deep sadness, a fear that that would never happen for me. I was angry. I would you know, be bitter towards friends of mine that were getting the life that I was waiting so long to experience. It drove a wedge in between several of us and I allowed it to eat away at my heart a little bit. When I began to question if God was going to call me into lifelong singleness, honestly that's probably my greatest fear and any time that thought would come up or topic at church or just in conversations with friends and family, I can almost feel myself just shrink up and want to run and not address that because that was just too much to bear. I struggle to even think about the future because when I do think about it, my mind tends to go negative and assume the worst. Just the fact that I don't know what my life will look like is a very scary thought. In the future, if I'm still single, what will that look like? What will that mean for my relationships with my friends and sister and you know, people in my life that I walk closely with that have husbands and families and children, their schedules are different, their lives look very different than mine. I still deal with the days and thoughts and struggles that I am going to be single forever. Those thoughts do still scare me and I don't always run to the Lord immediately when those come up, but he's slowly chipping away at that old idea that a relationship and that a husband is what it would take for my life to be meaningful. Slowly God has been chipping away at the idea that a relationship and a husband is what it will take for my life to be meaningful. I wonder if that perhaps resonates with you. Perhaps you have friends who feel like that. Uh, maybe as someone who's close to you, I don't know. But the truth is, the gospel is good news. God's word is full of good news. And we want to know what the good news is in this particular situation. What does it mean for us as followers of Jesus, as a church together, whether we are married or not, to play our part in living out that good news? 
that's singleness in society. What about singleness in Scripture? What does Scripture have to say about this whole idea? Well, the most famous person in all of history was single, wasn't he? Jesus was single. So there must be some encouragement in there. But Paul also, who wrote most of the New Testament, was also single. And he particularly seems to speak quite encouragingly of the single life. Uh, We're going to look at, very briefly, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you've got a Bible and you want to bring it up, then please do. The words, I think, will come up on the screen as well. But this is what Paul has to say about being single. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, to start off with, he says this. I wish that all of you were as am I. Single, is what he's talking about there. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. And he continues in verse 26 on this chapter. If you go through to the next left for us, this is what he says. Because of the present crisis, I think that it's good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Well, do not seek to be released. Are you free from such commitments? Well, then do not look for a wife. If you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you of this. We're not going to look at that bit particularly now. (laughs) Shall let that settle? And then move past it. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. We're not going to spend a huge amount of time on that bit either. We will come back to that kind of notion, though. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. But those who buy something as as if it's not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. For this world in its present form is passing away, he says. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may, have, that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Okay, we're going to pick out just three things from that where Paul particularly seems to be encouraging of the single life. First of all, verses 26 to 27, he mentions this present distress. The thought is that in Corinth at the time, there was some kind of famine going on, and that really what people needed to be focusing in on was not their relationship status, not getting married or finding a a spouse, but just dealing with the things that are going on in the everyday We've got this situation happening. Stop worrying about your married life and just make sure you've got some food to eat. Okay, that's more important. Seems to be where Paul is heading with that. So rather than worrying about what might happen in the future, just deal with the issues that you've got going on right now. Deal with your current situation. Uh, The next one in verses 28 to 31, he's saying time is short. Right now, For you guys in Corinth, being single is practical. It's not that Jesus is coming tomorrow, so don't bother getting married today. What he's saying is that now Jesus has been, there will come a point when he will return. And we live in this middle ground. And he's saying whilst we're in this middle ground between when Jesus has gone back to heaven and when Jesus will return again, right now your focus is to live for him. Focus on him. Live lives that are devoted to him. And then verses 32 to 35, he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. He says, look, if you're married, you've got lots of things to be thinking about. At which point, I'm getting some nods. I can see that. If you're not married, there are things that you don't have to think about. Paul seems to say there's a freedom from anxieties for those who are single. But this has led to two really cringy phrases. At least I think they're really cringy in the life of the church. 
and bear with me on this, but the first one is this idea of the gift of singleness, and the second is a call to singleness. They both feel like quite cringy phrases to me. In Scripture, the only time that we have this idea of being called to something uh, is twice, or in two particular occasions. The first instance is there are a few prophets who are spoken of as being called to be prophets. The second is when it comes to our relationship with God. The notion that God calls us to be his. It's not about a lifestyle that we lead. It's not about a career path that we go down. It just says in scripture, when you are called, it's when you are called by God to live in a relationship with him. So this idea of being called to singleness can become a bit of a cringe phrase, I think. And it can also give this kind of myth that if you're single, it's like a superpower to having an awesome relationship with God. You know, your, your call to singleness means that you're going to have some kind of ultra-divine lifestyle where everything will just come together and your relationship with God will just be perfect because you're not thinking about other things. That's not a reality either. But there can become this impression or danger that the value of your singleness is balanced out and only valuable in your devotion to God. Does that make sense? The only reason you're, you're single, the only value in being single is if you're really devoting every bit of your time to God. You're involved in ministries at church all the time because you don't have to look after young children or a family in some way. You're always on your knees in prayer and you're always reading scripture the whole time because that's just what you automatically do now that you are single. Well, that's, I don't think that's true. And I think Kelly points it out in the video. She says, when those dark moments kick in, her first thought isn't always to run to God and say, Lord, help me in this. There can be this underlying message that we can often give in church sometimes. That go and get married, great. Stay single, serve God. And that's not the case. That's not the way that it should be. The truth is, actually, that both situations, both relationship statuses, are gifts from God. And whatever your situation, that is the gift that God has given you at this time. Both relationship statuses should bring us closer to Jesus. Both should be used to glorify him. And neither will bring true fulfillment or identity without Christ. Neither will. It does seem here in, in Corinthians that Paul does highlight some of the benefits of being single. But Paul's heart is that all of his hearers, whether they are single, whether they are married, whether they are engaged, whatever it might be, his heart is that their hearts would be striving for Jesus. Whatever their situation, he wants their focus to be on Christ. Because the remain the the phrase that he repeats twice in there, which is so important, is remain. He says, whatever your situation is, remain in it. You don't need to change your situation, now you're following Jesus. So verse 17, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them, i.e. when God called them into a relationship with him. Each person, verse 20, should remain in the situation they're in when God called them. Verse 24, brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. The focus is on the relationship with God, not with others. It's about your relationship with Christ that is important. And so whatever your relationship situation was when God called you, Paul says, just remain in that. Focus on serving him. That is what is so important. In a culture which will say you are missing out if you don't have a partner, if you don't have a husband, wife, spouse, culture will say you're missing out. Paul says you've actually gained something. 
you've got this opportunity for undivided devotion, but I think that applies to whatever your situation is. Wherever you are at, we can be devoted to Christ. He's not saying that marriage is a bad thing, just like, um, you know, I, I like shopping at Aldi, you might like shopping at Sainsbury's. It's not that Aldi's bad or Sainsbury's is bad, it's just one is one place, one is another. It's whatever is right for that person. He does speak positively, positively, though, about being single. I wonder if it ever feels like that. Although he says it's, it's a good thing and can be a gift in some ways, I wonder if being single really feels like that. If that is you, many of the things that Kelly spoke about on that video and other videos that I've watched uh, these past few weeks uh, and stories that I've read, those who are on their own will talk about the loneliness. They will talk about insecurities. Kelly mentioned that feeling of kind of third wheeling forever. What am I going to do when all my friends go off and get married and my family are gone to go and get married? There'll be issues of unmet desires for family. There might be struggles with identity, grieving ideals, all sorts of different challenges that come in when you are single. And the message in culture is if you get married, you don't have to deal with those things. I wonder if you're married here this morning, if you'd agree with that, though. The reality is very different as well, because it is very, very possible to be married and feel very alone. It's possible to be married and to have a whole bunch of insecurities. You can be married and have to deal with desire, unmet desires for a family. You can be married and have to grieve your ideals of what family life was going to look like. You can be married and really struggle with knowing who you are or your identity. And so our relationship status can't be the answer. Our security has to be found somewhere else. Our security is found in our saviour. That's where our security is. That's the good news of the Christian message. That's the good news of the gospel, that our security is in our saviour and nowhere else. One preacher put it this way, saying that two sinners sharing bed, bath and bank is never going to solve anything. It's not that Christians suddenly have perfect marriages because they're Christians. That's not how it works. The Christian, the individual, finds their security in their saviour. Verse, uh, Psalm 25, uh, verse 4, says this, Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. In knowing the one who has knitted us together, that is where we'll find our security. Knowing the one who formed us and created us, that is where we will find our identity. That's where we will find the answer to our loneliness, the comfort in our grief, our true identity as dearly loved children of a heavenly father. It's in him and through him that we find out who we really are. And it's in knowing him and being a child of his that he brings us into a family. He brings us into the local family of the church. He brings us into the global family of the church. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But it's one thing to be a family. It is another thing to live as a family. It's one thing to be a family, but it's another to live as one. I wonder, if you are single and here this morning, how do you feel about church life? I wonder if you are thriving within church life or whether sometimes you feel like you are just surviving. I'm going to tell a, a little, share something about me which um, is my greatest fear. Do you want to know my greatest fear? And this is genuinely my, my biggest fear. It's not spiders. I get a little bit of claustrophobia. I don't like being in tight spaces, caves, stuff like that. My biggest fear, though, is getting a present that I don't like. <laughs> Honestly. My biggest fear 
is getting a present that I don't like. I cannot deal with it. I can't handle it. Knowing that someone's bought me this gift, they thought of me, they thought, oh, a guy will like this, let's get that for him. And then I get it, and I'm like, oh, thanks. Uh, so I remember when I was younger, my nan, bless her heart, she bought me a little Thomas the Tank Engine locomotive, which was meant to fit on a track. I didn't have the track. <laughs> I had nothing else for it. I, I ended up with just this little Thomas the Tank Engine engine, or a locomotive thing, but nothing to, to play it with, nothing to use it on. And I felt shocking. I was, inside, I'm like, it's painful. It's painful what goes on inside at that moment. I'm sitting there thinking, right, I'm going to have to save all my pocket money now to buy the rest of the track so I can actually use this one gift. I'm going to have to spend a fortune to make this gift worthwhile because without the rest of the track, it's useless. I can't do anything with it. But I'm still sat there going, oh, thanks, Nan. I love it. Because I can't deal with the idea of saying no. There you go. That's my greatest fear. Here's the thing. That locomotive is great if I've got the rest of the track. It's not particularly useful on its own. Being in a church family means we have a family to live within and to be part of. And if our gift is singleness, if we find ourselves in that situation, it finds its place and hopefully, God willing, finds its home within the family of the church. Not the Sunday morning service, not the, the, the religious activity that might take place, but in actually being a family and living as a family together. That's where we find our home. That's where we find some of those other needs perhaps met through our church family. It raises a question, though, doesn't it? It raises a question of what is the underlying culture of our church? We could say the church, which means it can all go out there, and we don't have to think about it, and we can just talk about other churches, but I want to ask the question, what's the culture of our church? And I'm very aware that as I stand here saying that, as I mentioned earlier, I am the family's pastor. And so a lot of my focus is on kind of the family life, particularly thinking about young children, teenagers, and those kinds of things. But we want to think about what it is to be a family together as a church. And so very briefly, just as I come to a close, there's three things I think we need to rethink when it comes to life as a family and how we fit within it, okay? Uh, the first one is that we need to rethink what we think about sex. We need to rethink that. The lie in culture is that sexuality is my identity. That's the lie that's out there. Look inside yourself, find out who you are, and then express it in whatever way you like. That's what culture says. Look inside yourself, find it, express it. And that is where your identity is. It's all bound up in our sexuality. When I was at high school, year seven, when I first started high school, the question on the playground was either what TV, show, sh TV shows do you like or what do you want to be when you grow up? They were kind of the two things we'd talk about. Do you know what the, the biggest question on the Year 7 playground was this year? How do you identify? As if that is who you are. Whatever your attraction might be or whatever you might identify yourself in terms of your gender, that was the question. And it's just not a good one. It's just not a good one. First of all, to look inside yourself and to work out what you think and feel and then base that uh, your whole identity on that is massively unstable, isn't it? Because our feelings and our emotions change. And so you can't rely on those things. And then secondly, it's really ambiguous. Because what we'll do is we'll look inside of ourselves, we'll pick out the bits that fit with the culture around us that we think other people might like or agree with or the, the buzz phrases for the time, and we'll cherry pick those ones. And we'll say, oh, let's go with that and go with that because that will then mean I fit in with what's going on around me. The Bible says you need to look to your creator to know who you truly are. Look to God, and he can tell you who you truly are. The Christian identity is the only true one because it connects us to our creator. When God says, come and follow me, he's not saying, turn up, 
and now show up and jump through a bunch of hoops to show me how good you are. He says, come and be the real you and come and have the fullness of life in me. That's the invitation that God puts to us. The second thing that we need to understand as well, or rethink, is love. We all have a need to be loved, but I wonder if you notice when Jesus speaks about love, he never talks about marriage, and he never talks about sex. When Jesus speaks of love, he speaks of friendship. In John 15, 11, he says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus points to friendship as a true place of love, well over and above anything else. Being a follower of Jesus and being part of the church, both local and global, will mean that we have a worldwide family that we belong to. You can rock up at a church on the other side of the country and you can meet brothers and sisters. You can rock up at a church on the other side of the world and you can meet brothers and sisters. Church should be the place where everyone who walks through the door will feel loved and know love. Love one another as I have loved you. The third thing to rethink is family. We've got to think about what family really looks like in the life of the church. There's the phrase, isn't there, the Englishman's house is his castle, and it's never been more true in the world today that, you know, you get home, you, you draw up the, the battle bridge, whatever it is, the, the drawbridge, you shut the doors, and it's like, right, this is it. Inside these four walls, this is my space, no one's coming in, leave me alone, I'm all good. We're not like that in terms of being part of God's family. God's family should not be like that. There is a question, isn't there, for us about how we're going to live as family. To live normal life, side by side, and invite others to join in. What would it look like for us to do that? What would it look like for you to do that? One of the, the big challenges that we've been discussing in staff over these last few weeks is with the beginning of a second service, so we now have the 7 o'clock service in the evening, how do we not become a church which just has different services for different ages and stages and phases of life? Because we want to be a genuine family together. But when you have more services, there's always this danger that the 10 o'clock becomes like the family service where all the, the children are out and the young people are out, and then the 7 o'clock can become whatever the 7 o'clock wants to become, whether it be a service for the, the, the grown-up grown-ups or the teenagers or whatever else it might be. You can end up with a divided family meeting at different times. It's one of the reasons that we've said that we're not going to do the 7 o'clock service on the big celebration days. So like Easter Day, we'll have one service at 10 o'clock because we want to be family together. We want everyone in the same space. We want to make sure that we keep our values as a family church. Not the 2.4 family church, but as God's family. Where all ages meet together. Where everybody feels welcome, where it doesn't matter what your situation is, what your relationship status is, whether you're a single person, a young family, an empty nester, a widow, a divorcee, whatever it might be, everyone is welcome. And there's a question for us in there, isn't there? How do we contribute to this family being a place where everyone is welcome? What can we do? This is not a volunteer cry, just to clarify. This is not me looking for volunteers for children's groups. This is me saying, how are you going to connect with others this morning over coffee? How are you going to connect with others this week? Who are you going to invite to share your life to make this a place where everyone feels welcome? A place where everyone is part of, regardless of their family situation, regardless of our relationship status. What is it that God is calling you to do? What is God calling me to do to enable those who are single to thrive within the life of this church and not just survive it? 
What is it that God is calling us to do? I'm going to pray for us. Uh, I'm going to have a moment of quiet at the start. Maybe just to, to pause, to reflect, to think about what is it that God has put on your heart? What is it that God is calling uh, me to do? Perhaps even just this morning, who is there that I could go and connect with over coffee who I wouldn't normally go and chat to? Who is there that I could invite over this week? Just a moment of quiet. Just let the Lord speak to you in whatever way he would like to do that. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you know every single one of us here completely, that there is nothing that is hidden from you. Father, thank you that you made us, that you knitted us together. And Father, thank you that you love us so much that you sent Jesus for us. Father, you know deep down the things of our heart, the the insecurities, the fears, the struggles, the concerns, the things that, that weigh on us day by day. Father, we know sometimes in our minds that uh, the answer to those or the way of dealing with those is to come to you, but we're also very aware that that's not always our first response. Father, we want to come to you this morning and ask for your healing hands in those areas where we feel pain, we bring those to you. Father, thank you that you bless us with a church family, that being in a relationship with you means that we have a relationship with brothers and sisters in this building this morning. Father, thank you for the blessing that that is. Father, I pray that we wouldn't take that for granted, but that you would help us to know how we can uh, help that to thrive. How can we encourage uh, this as a, our church family to thrive of all ages, all stages, and all situations? That this would be a place where people feel truly loved and welcomed. Father, we thank you that you welcome us. Thank you that you call us into a relationship with you. Father, we want to worship you for that. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.